Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully uh, you can all see and hear us at this stage um, and welcome to this, the second in NASLA's co-hosted webinar series and the second uh, presented with our friends at OCLC in the United States. Uh, kia ora also to colleagues joining us from New Zealand Aotearoa today. My name is Barbara Lemon and I'm Executive Officer for National and State Libraries Australia, otherwise known as NSLA or NASLA. Uh, NASLA is the peak body for Australia's national state and territory libraries. So I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging Australia's First Nations peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which our libraries do their daily work, preserving and sharing our heritage, in my case, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We are hugely lucky to be um, presented today with a session coming out of an enormous amount of work by one of the OCLC uh, research partnership working groups um, to help us tackle the age old uh, problem of descriptive backlogs in our special collections by really looking at the cost of selection decisions and collection building. So first up we'll have uh, Chella Scott Weber, Senior Program Officer for the OCLC Research Library Partnership uh, to introduce this new framework and set of tools. Uh, then Carrie Hintz, Associate Director of the Rose Library at Emory University, will talk us through how she and her colleagues have used the tools in practice. We should have uh, about 15 minutes at the end of the session for Q&A, so go ahead and pop your questions uh, into the Q&A module as we go along uh, by clicking the link at the bottom of your screen, um, as Amy has let you know in the chat, and we'll pick those up uh, as we go and gather them together at the end. So um, over to you, Chella. Perfect, thanks so much. Um, let's see. Uh, I just share my screen here. Sorry, hold on just one second. Um, let's see, are we recording this? We are, I need to quit and reopen Zoom in order to be recorded, I'm sorry. That's okay, um, we'll uh, sit tight. What's that? We'll sit tight. Okay, I'll be right back. Thanks for your patience, everyone. For anyone who's just joined, we're just waiting for our speaker to re-log re in. Okay, I think we're in business. Um, <laughs> can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Excellent, <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, apologies there for the um, technical difficulty. So, um, Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, good afternoon from the United States. <laughs> uh, good morning to you all in Australia. Um, and thanks uh, to Barb and Amy for inviting us to speak with you today. Carrie and I are, are really excited to be able to share this work with you. While the work comes out of an American context, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit, we do hope it will have relevance to you in your programs, and we look forward to hearing more about how it might be useful to you in the Q&A. Um, so, uh, um, give you some pictures of who's talking, who's talking at you through the screen. Um, I'm Jayla Scott Weber. I'm a senior program officer with the OCLC Research Library Partnership, where I focus on work in archives, special and distinctive collections. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Carrie. Hey, I'm Carrie Hintz. Um, I'm the associate director of the Rose Library at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and so uh, we're here today to talk to you about um, total cost of stewardship, responsible collection building in archives and special collections, uh, a, a recent report from OCLC research. 
Um, and I'll get started by sharing information about the publication, and then Carrie will share some of her experience implementing the tools and practices that we advocate in the report. Um, so the publication is not just a report, but it's a body of materials that includes the report, an annotated bibliography of sources relevant to the ideas in the report, and then a suite of practical tools that you can adapt and implement at your own institution. I'll share a little bit about the context for why we pursued this project, the working group that created it, the major some of the major ideas of the report, and then I'll give you a quick glimpse into some of the tools themselves. So as a, a little bit of context, I am a program officer for the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which is one of the programs of OCLC's research division. Uh, OCLC Research and the RLP have a long history of working in archives and special collections because we recognize them as an important site of knowledge creation made possible by the library's investment in the stewardship of these materials. And so we try to support the partnership in making best possible use of that investment in special collections. Um, our research and learning agenda for archives, special and distinctive collections has been guiding our priorities for work in this area since its publication in 2017. And among the key issues articulated in the agenda were the evolving needs of stewardship and the enduring challenge of descriptive backlogs, uh, and a desire to re-engage with and, and rethink appraisal for contemporary collecting, and a real need for tools and skills to be used in advocacy efforts towards supporting archives and special collections programs and valuing the labor that goes into collections care. So with these needs around stewardship and appraisal and advocacy in mind, we convened the Collection Building and Operational Impacts Working Group. It brought together a really wonderful group of colleagues who hold a wide range of curatorial, collection management, and administrative roles in both academic and independent research libraries uh, across our partnership. And the work I'm sharing with you today is due to the efforts of everyone on this slide, and I'm tremendously grateful to them for their engaged collaboration over the course of the past two years. Um, I'll also pause here to acknowledge that this work really does come out of an American context, as I've mentioned, where the landscape of archives and special collections is somewhat different than what you all have in Australia. Um, we do not have the same kind of robust and unified national and state library system. Um, while we do have the Library of Congress and the National Archives and many state and municipal libraries and archives, they do not have the same consistent collecting scopes, mandates, or programs. And so ac academic and independent research libraries and public libraries and museums and historical societies and other cultural heritage institutions really play a major role in preserving the cultural and historical record. So most of the members of this working group come out of the academic and independent research libraries with robust collecting programs centered around specific topics or geographies or collecting mandates. So as this group started its work, we identified what we felt was a really important disconnect in both practice and in communication. Um, we saw a disconnect between the way that we were dealing with backlogs and the way that we saw them being created. Uh, that no matter how efficient technical services became, backlogs kept growing because institutions were collecting beyond their capacity to steward. And then we also saw a disconnect between the staff doing this work. So those tasked with bringing in collections often were not communicating with collection stewards. And so the important skills and knowledge that each of these groups has, could, they couldn't benefit from each other. And so the working group goals um, we set out for ourselves were really to explore the intersections between collecting, collecting and collection management practice, to try to find better ways to integrate those two practices together, and then find better ways to integrate bring to, and bring together colleagues from across these important and interdependent functions. Um, we began our report by contextualizing it within the conversation the profession has been having about backlogs and resource allocation for at least two decades now, which has largely focused on hidden collections and how to address them through increased efficiency in technical services. 
we and we argue that the persistence of this issue makes clear that it cannot be addressed solely through increased efficiency and infusions of resources via temporary labor, and that our capacity for collection stewardship must be a regular part of collection building conversations. Um, and we know that while we are accustomed to thinking of an annual collecting budget as a constraint on collecting, we are not as accustomed to thinking about our capacity to steward as a constraint. And so we argue that a key to making informed collection development and appraisal decisions is a strong understanding of the necessary institutional resources and capacity for the work to preserve, preserve describe, store, and make accessible collection material. In the report, we offer up the idea of total cost of stewardship to consider the full and true resources necessary to carry, care for a special collections acquisition. We define total cost of stewardship as all of the costs associated with building, managing, and caring for collections so that they can be used by and useful to the public. So the total cost of stewardship borrows from the idea of total cost of ownership, which is defined as a as the initial cost to purchase something plus the costs of ongoing operation, but it adds an important ethical layer to cost considerations. Um, underlying this definition is the understanding that research libraries and cultural heritage institutions hold their archives and special collections in trust for the public. And um, that we uphold a professional value of providing broad and equitable access to rare and unique collections. And the idea that for our collections to be truly valuable, they must also be available for use. And in this light, we see backlogs as a potential breach of trust. They hurt our relationships with donors and creators of collections and keep material from being able to be equitably used by researchers. So total cost of stewardship acknowledges that responsible collecting does not stop at acquisition, but considers all of the activities that are necessary to make collections accessible and deliver on our promise to collection donors and creators and the people and communities that those collections document. This approach accounts for the direct costs like purchase price or other acquisition expenses, as well as the ongoing operational costs of stewarding like cataloging and processing and preservation and digitization. We also propose a total cost of stewardship framework, which operationalizes the ideas and goals that we lay out in the report. It's a model of working that considers the value of a potential acquisition and its alignment with institutional mission and goals alongside the cost to acquire and care for and manage that potential acquisition, the labor and the specialized skills required to do that work, and institutional capacity to care for and store collections. Um, in the report, we talk about the benefits of working within this model. I think it can support planning and advocacy efforts. It can help us understand and build capacities around uh, contemporary collecting formats like our audiovisual and born digital formats and build skills for sensitive and necessarily labor intensive work like reparative description. Um, it can also really help to make sure that new acquisitions support mission and bring true value and that the repository can do the work necessary to support that value. So in addition to the report, we, uh, we, off we offer up a tool suite that supports this framework. So we've produced two kinds of tools. Uh, cost and capacity estimation tools that facilitate estimation of the, the tangible costs of addressing collection needs, and then communication tools that facilitate discussion of both the, the tangible, the labor and supply and other costs, and intangible, the research and community and other kinds of value factors that are weighed in collecting building decisions. All of the tools are designed to bring people together, to support communication, to assure alignment with mission and goals and to support consistent assessment of capacity and capacity impact. Um, so all of the tools are also designed to for you to use. <laughs> um, they are designed to complement and be used in conjunction with each other. 
uh, they're intended to be flexible and broadly applicable to as many to many different kinds of collecting institutions, and a, an institution can use one of them or all of them, uh, as is most useful to their circumstances. Um, along with the tools themselves, we've included a detailed manual for the cost estimation tools and a usage guide for the communication tools that include guidance for considerations for each of the templates and offer links to examples from different institutions for similar kinds of tools. Um, they are also customizable. So there are um, Word versions of all of the templates. The cost estimation tools are, are Excel spreadsheets. Um, you can download them all, you can fill them out and customize them for use in your own institution. And the templates are really kind of maximal in nature and include a lot of factors that may or may not be relevant to different collecting institutions. So you will you would likely want to tailor them to fit your own institutional needs and resources and priorities and workflows. Um, and you know, many of you already may have existing policies or documents similar to the tools we outline, and you can use the templates and guidelines to create new documents or to review your existing policies to make sure that they're supporting the kinds of communication and decision making you want to enact. Um, they can also be used iteratively throughout an acquisition process. Uh, they require input from multiple people and they can be refined and updated at various stages as different stakeholders learn more about collections and their operational impacts. So, Onto the tools themselves. Um, each of the tools supports one of the four elements of the framework. I'll go ahead and walk you through each element of the framework and its associated tools. Uh, I won't get into great detail about every single one of them, but we'll spend a little more time on the tools that we think are, are unique to our work. So the first element of the framework is documenting collecting priorities. Um, so that everyone is clear on what you want to collect. And this is, of course, a foundational step. <laughs> and, and the collection development policy is the foundational document for, for this phase. Um, our collection development policy template supports you in writing a new or examining an existing policy. And while collection development policies certainly aren't a new invention, ours works to support the total cost of stewardship framework, focusing on ensuring that our repositories collections support the institutional mission. Um, it provides criteria to guide collecting decisions and can support consistent and careful communication with donors and other stakeholders. The next, um, the next element of the framework is determine stewardship capacity so that you know the time and skills and monetary resources you have available to allocate to collection needs. To support this, we have created two different cost estimation tools, which I'll go ahead and spend a little bit of time showing you. The first is the quick cost estimator, um, which uses some existing time estimation models for cataloging and processing and turns them into actionable spreadsheets. Um, which you can use to get a, a quick estimate of the time required to catalog or process materials in archives and special collections and, and kind of what different levels of effort and detail might mean in terms of hours. Um, so the calculations are based on existing models for time estimation for bibliographic cataloging and archival processing from the University of Florida's library, the University of California libraries, and the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. Um, it also allows you to put in your own local model if you, um, if you have a time estimation model that you use at your institution. I will pause here and say that the models for archival processing um, are do you use linear feet as uh, as the unit of measurement. Um, you could go in and alter the um, the uh, the the formulas in the back to to make use of the metric system instead of using feet. Um, and there are instructions in the manual about how to. Uh, how to customize these spreadsheets. 
Um, so you start, so these are the, the kind of the models, the time estimation models. And then the, the tool um, for cataloging, you enter the number of titles that you will catalog at each level of effort, whether it's full original cataloging for rare books or enhanced copy cataloging or quick copy, catalog or quick copy cataloging, you enter in the number of items and then um, it will tell you a minimum and maximum amount of time that it estimates uh, this work will take. And similarly, for archival collections, you enter the linear footage uh, of the, the amount of the collection that you think would be processed at a different level of effort, and it will give you the minimum and maximum number of hours. The next tool is the operational impact estimator, which is a, a bit of a more robust tool. So, uh, which we also refer to as the OIE for short. Um, the OIE allows you to lay out institutional staffing and budgetary capacity for collection stewardship activities, and then assess how a specific collection or potential acquisition might impact that capacity. It's designed to help consider both the costs of the work necessary to respond to responsibly care for a collection and the impact to an institution's total annual capacity for collection stewardship work. So the tool starts with you defining your staffing. Um, so you lay out all of the staff roles and associated salaries for everyone who works on collection management activities at your institution. And then you um, define the percentage of time that those positions allocate toward collection management activities. And then you walk through the collection life cycle kind of through, from pre-acquisition through to ongoing stewardship to estimate the likely necessary activities and the time they'll take and who will do them. And then the tool takes all of that data that you have entered and shows you how the potential acquisition would impact your annual capacity to do this work. It expresses this capacity in both time increments and in a percentage of your total capacity. And it also gives you a detailed summary, a, a summary up top of uh, how it impacts com total capacity. And then it gives you a detail of per position, how it in impacts capacity. So the next element of the framework is gather and share information. Uh, so that to share information about the impact an acquisition will have on a repository staff and operations to support informed decision making in the moment and responsible stewardship into the future. The operational impact report supports this element of the framework. It's a report that assesses and outlines the cost and time and labor and skills and other resources that will need to be dedicated to a collection to steward it effectively and responsibly. Um, it pulls together information about a collection that might be gathered on site visits or pre-acquisition conversations with collection donors, and then reports on the cost estimates for cataloging and processing and digitizing collections, along with other impacts to institutional capacities and operations. The last element of the framework is make decisions together and it, that bring together a shared understanding about the value a collection might bring and the resources that will be necessary to realize that value. And there are three tools that we think support this element. The first is the acquisition proposal. Um, and it helps repositories make decisions about whether to acquire a collection. It assesses both the research and institutional value of a given collection and the resources that would be required to steward it. Um, it brings in the kind of information that you would put in the operational impact report uh, about cost and impact estimates for processing and cataloging, along with detail about value, research value, and other values the, the collection might bring. 
Um, and it can provide resource allocators with the information they need to make informed decision about whether a collection is worth acquiring and if the repository has or can acquire the resources necessary to manage it. Um, the next tool is the processing plan, and it is a document that establishes the work that will be done in arranging and describing an archival collection. Um, it, and it can also serve as a record of key decisions about work done on a collection. And while processing plans are certainly not new, we included it in our tool suite because we think it is an important communication tool between stakeholders and special collections and can be used to support informed communication and decision making between the processor, their supervisor and curators or public service archivists who may have important knowledge about the collection, its creation, or its likely uses. And last but not least is the digitization project assessment, um, which is a document that assesses the viability of a proposed digitization project. Uh, we know that digitization often requires time and resources and expertise from multiple people or units, making it even more critical that all parties involved have a shared sense of purpose and understanding. Um, so the, the project proposal includes a number of elements uh, that will likely need to come from multiple colleagues in your institution, including information about scope of the project, a research and value analysis that assesses how the potential value of the project aligns with institutional priorities, uh, a project needs and work analysis that's not just about digitization needs, but other technical and physical and descriptive needs and how they align with institutional capacity, and then ends with an assessment and recommendation section um, for review and comments and an assessment of whether the project should move forward. So that's the summary of the tool suite. And before I turn it over to Carrie, I just wanna highlight some upcoming opportunities to learn more and get uh, support in using the total cost of stewardship tools and implementing the framework. Um, we will be posting tutorial videos for the tools uh, within the next day or two um, on our website. Uh, they'll be on the same page with the rest of the, the materials for the report and the tool suite. We're also doing some open office hours where you can just come with your questions and we will try to answer them. Um, I'll highlight that on May 12th that we are doing one that is in an Australia time zone friendly slot. Um, we're also doing a Twitter chat on May 20th, which is later in the day, but would be pretty early in the morning for you all. But if you're early birds, we would welcome you to join us. And then we'll be uh, presenting at upcoming conferences in June and July, RBMS and SAA here in the US and the DC, DC conference in, in the UK. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Carrie. All right, hello everyone. Oh, we're at the end of my slide, Let's go to the beginning. Um, my name is Carrie Hintz and I'm the Associate Director of the Rose Library. And I am pleased to be joining you this evening um, from Atlanta, Georgia, which is the ancestral home of the Muscogee Creek people. Um, as we dive in, I wanna start my my presentation by talking a little bit about myself. Um, the focus of my presentation is going to be talking about how we have implemented some of these tools that Shayla was, was presenting and talking about within my institution and different ways that we've taken some of these values and workflows that we covered in the report and tried to put them into practice. Um, so I think it's useful to know the different hats that I've worn and the roles that I've played at Emory over the course of time that we've been doing this work. Um, so when we started this project and started um, thinking through putting together this, this stewardship framework, um, I was playing two roles. I, my main role was the head of collection services. And in that role, I oversaw the technical services work of the library. So the archival processing, the, the book cataloging, stacks management, that sort of side of the house. I was also in the middle of an 18 month stint as our interim curator for literary and poetry collections. 
So as I approached this work, I was really thinking a lot about building collections, working with donors, and spending a lot of my time doing that kind of collection building work um, and, and thinking through all of the different pieces and how it connects with other, with other folks in the library. And now I'm primarily an administrator. Um, as the associate director of the Rose Library, I I'm interested really in the collection building work, mostly as someone who kind of sits above and can and can take the bird's eye view of the work that's going on and understand all of the different pieces, the moving pieces of a new acquisition. Um, and in that role, I'm also thinking about funding strategies for new acquisitions and making sure that we have the general institutional capacity to manage um, any new work that's coming in the door. I also think it's a little, it's useful to talk a little bit about the library that I work in. Um, so we are, as Chayla was kind of mentioning earlier, a collecting institution that focuses mostly on building subject-based collections in a few different areas, including African-American history, um, political and social movements, um, as well as housing our university archives, which we do have a mandate to collect the records of the university. We are one library within a system of libraries, the university, and we are the main special collections and archives, um, but not the only one. Our preservation and digitization units are two separate units, um, and they serve 12 different campus libraries. So we are a main customer and a large customer for those units, but we're not the only customer, um, and, and they direct and manage their own, their own work and workflows. We're a relatively large, library. We have about 25 staff members. And those 25 staff members occupy space on six different floors of our main library building. So while all of our um, research services staff kind of work in the same general area, and all of our collection services staff work in the same general area, our curatorial staff is spread across a number of different floors. And none of those different units um, work near each other. So a lot of those water cooler conversations and casual kind of drop bys and updates that you often have in, in a more tightly connected office environment don't necessarily happen quite as naturally um, within our institution. So as we're thinking about this total cost of stewardship framework, the two pieces that were really important to me and the two places that I'm going to focus on talking about today because they were the first steps of implementation were around that gathering and sharing information piece and the making decisions together um, because of the way that we are situated in the building, meaning that we need to be a little bit more intentional and thoughtful and formal about how we do this communication and information sharing. So I'm going to be focused mostly on those communication tools um, and specifically the operational impact report template and the acquisition proposal template. So we did have some building blocks in place to do some of the communication and, and collective decision-making that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so historically, as long as I've worked at the library, when someone who's doing collection development, um, a curator or an administrator is interested in bringing in a particular collection, they would put together what we call the one pager for the collection, um, which as the name implies is something that is pretty brief, um, usually about a page, um, and really kind of focused mostly on the intellectual and research value of a collection, you know, kind of outlining why a collection is important, who the creator is, um, why this collection might matter and be useful to have as part of our, our more our broader collections. Um, and then they would take that one pager to the curators group, um, which was just the team of curators who, who work in the library and the director and associate director and discuss that proposal with them and then make a decision within that group. So what we've really done is kind of fleshed those building blocks out a little bit and created in a lot more points of contact between different staff members in this process. So we still do the information gathering work, um, talking to donors, visiting collections, and doing some on-site appraisal and assessment of a collection. But rather than coming directly back and taking that information right to a decision-making body, um, now those of us who do collection development work in my library will take that information, we'll come back, we'll have a couple of conversations with our technical services team, um, and then 
draft an operational impact statement for the collection. Um, and that operational impact statement, we use something very, very similar to the template that we proposed as part of this set of communication tools. Um, so we didn't really change that very much and kind of lifted almost one-to-one -one kind of using the, the same tool that was, was published as part of the report and, and tool set. Um, and we usually have our head of collections processing or our rare book librarian is the one who actually drafts that operational impact statement. So taking the information from the curator um, and then taking what they know about what the actual labor and time um, and sort of supplies and knowledge needed to steward a particular collection and they add that in. Um, and then that becomes part of the broader potential acquisition report that the curator drafts and puts together with much more information um, about the size and scope of the collection, how it connects to our collection development strategies and policies, um, what kind of curricular support there may be, um, because being located within an educational institution, we do also want to make sure that um, the collections that we bring in are useful to our students and to our faculty and can support um, teaching and learning um, at the university. And then that report goes to the collection strategies group, which still includes all of the curators, the director and the associate director of the library. Um, but now we've also expanded that decision making group to include our accessioning archivist who manages a lot of the acquisitions process um, and also someone from our development team who can help us think about fundraising or um, doing other kinds of promotion around a new acquisition. So I've included a couple of screenshots here about what our operational impact report looks like. Um, so over on the left, it's just a screenshot of what, what a full completed report might look like. Um, but over on the right, the overall assessment piece, I wanted to draw a little bit of attention to the way that we use this overall assessment portion. Um, because I think that looking at the toolkit, it's easy to think that this is mostly useful for kind of accounting purposes, right? Like it will cost us this much, it will take us this much time, like here's the math. Um, and it is really useful for doing the math. It's really useful for project planning, for thinking about grants, um, for managing institutional records transfers. But it's also a really good place for us to just ask questions or to raise some issues or to point out things that might be obvious to someone like our rare book librarian that might not be quite as obvious or on the mind of a curator or someone who's doing the collecting, like this collection is too large to be delivered to our main library building and needs to go to our offsite storage facility, or there's some real conservation issues that are potentially, that we may run into with the scrapbooks or the albums. Um, if we're going to digitize something, here are the additional things that we'll need to think about or the, the digital storage space, the costs that we would accrue there. So it's, it's a place for us to make some assessments, but also it's a place for us to ask a lot, of a, quest, a lot of questions and just raise things up to make sure that when we're going forward and making decisions, we're kind of doing so with full knowledge of what might crop up down the, down the lane and what the downstream impacts might be. So then we take that operational impact form that usually leads to a few more conversations, um, whether that's conversations with a donor of a collection about what their expectations are around digitization or around how soon a collection will be open and available, or whether that's conversations with our digitization team or our digital archivist to get more information, whatever it may be. And then we take all of that information from, from those conversations that we've had as, as a larger group across the library. And then the curator starts putting that information into this acquisition report. Um, we have taken a lot from the report, um, the, the set of tools that the OCLC working group put together. But this is a place that we've also done a lot of customization. Um, and that's something I really, think is important to drive home about this suite of tools is how flexible and customizable they really are. Um, we, there are certain things that the OCLC template asks that just 
are not particularly useful in our institutional context or as information that we already have. So we deleted that. We added in some other things that matter to us. Um, so it really is, I think, an opportunity and we welcome you to take these and, and to use them in a way that makes sense for your organization, makes sense for your staff. Um, for example, one of the things that we did is we took the information and the questions from the acquisition report and we turned it into a web form. Um, we did this for a couple of different reasons. One is that our curators are often, um, it was really important to them that they have something mobile friendly um, because they're often filling this out in the field or at least starting to take notes out in the field. So they wanted something that they would be able to use on their tablets, on their phones. Um, Another thing is that this form also gives us the possibility to do is make certain pieces of this required. Um, so as Jill said, this can kind of look a little bit maximal. Some of our tools are a little bit maximal. So this gives us a way to offer the maximal and to try and get as much information um, as possible, but also to target what it is that we all really need to know in order to decide whether or not this acquisition is something to move forward. And the third reason that we selected a web form is because doing it in this way, um, we get all of the information in you know, one report, but it also puts everything that is entered um, into a spreadsheet. So it gives us an opportunity to go in and take a one at a glance look at all kind of potential new acquisitions that are in the works and get that bird's eye view, which is really helpful certainly for me as an administrator to see all of the different balls that are in the air um, and all of the things that are in the works. It's been really great. Um, and I think that we have dropped into the chat a link to a sort of mock-up version of the forum that we use. Um, we've duplicated it and created a forum. So if any of you want to go in and take a look and mess around and add in your own information and play with this form. Um, I very much welcome you and invite you to do that. Again, I just took a couple of really quick screen captures to walk through the kinds of things that we're asking and the kind of ways that we're asking questions of each other as we fill out this form. Um, so we'll see things that like the extent type and the formats um, of that are present in a particular collection are here and those are required fields. Uh, but we're asking things about how does this connect to our collection policy? What's the research value? Um, what is the diversity and documentation value? Um, does it document an underdocumented community or diversify our collections in a meaningful way um, that is useful information for us to have? Continuing to go through and ask things like the context of creation and custodial history, current arrangement. Um, and then there's a place to link that operational impact report that we already discussed. So that becomes part of this whole packet. So I'd say we've been doing this in some way, shape or form for probably about 18 months now, playing with, with these different kinds of tools, iterating on them, adjusting them, changing them to meet our needs. And some of the initial takeaways that I've had, um, the first one is it really has improved our communication and given us more advocacy tools as we're talking to different people within our organization. So those of any of you who have ever done collection development work know that when you're thinking about a new collection, everybody wants to know something different about it. So you're going into a meeting and your administrator or your manager your director wants to know what the research value of the collection is why does it matter why is it meaningful why is it something we should have in our collections the development person might want to know how much it would cost to process or promote the collection to see if they can do fundraising around it to help us the archivist needs to know the context and creation of use of that collection so that they can take that information and incorporate it into the archival description later on down the line as they're doing processing and putting that description up and making it available. Your finance person might wanna know the payment terms for something and your stacks manager just needs to know how many boxes are coming in the door and figure out which shelves to put it on. Um, so everybody needs to know kind of different things and it's been really useful for us that now we can answer all of those questions from all of those stakeholders from the beginning. Um, I think one of the one of the concerns in my organization was that possibly 
this was going to require a little bit too much kind of work up front at the beginning of thinking about bringing in a new collection it required a lot of information right from the get-go. Um, and that is something that is true, but I do think that our ability to then go through and have all of that at our fingertips and, and bring that information into all of these different kinds of conversations and not have to be continually going back and trying to kind of extract new pieces of information as the process unfolds has saved us a significant amount of time. The next takeaway is around decision making. Um, and I think unsurprisingly, when we have this much information about a collection going into a decision making process, and we've already thought about what will it cost to digitize a collection if we're planning on doing that? What will it cost to process a collection? Um, what are the copyright considerations we may encounter if we wanna make this available online? That we've already kind of pulled all of this together it really helps us collaborate across, across that um, collection development team to make good decisions together. It helps us prioritize what collections are most important or most valuable to bring in or how they should be slotted for different kinds of projects. Um, it's a great planning tool. And it also that more robust discussion that we have makes it a lot easier for us to across our different subject collecting areas, find the areas of common ground and build upon each other's collections a little bit better and to have a, a better high level understanding of what we're all doing as a library and how to build these collections in the same way um, and in, in a way that makes sense to have everything together. One thing that has surprised me a little bit has been, it's also been a great tool for increasing trust um, within our organization and especially across kind of different units and different different parts of the staff um, because we're sharing information pretty broadly with everyone. Um, everyone can go to one place, see everything they need to know. I think that sometimes information is something that is kind of used as currency in organizations. And so telling someone the one thing they need to know to do the next step of a process makes a lot of sense on, on one hand, but can sometimes feel like withholding information. And so now everyone has sort of an equal playing field access to all information about a new acquisition, which has been a really good trust building exercise for us. And then finally, another thing that has possibly surprised me a little bit is it has been a good workflow management tool for us um, because of the form that we use and the fact that um, much of this information gets moved into a spreadsheet. We added a couple of different um, fields within that spreadsheet that let us track what stage of an acquisition a new collection is at. Um, so we can take a look there and once something gets delivered, we kind of move it to one particular stage when something has been, the deed of gift has been signed by the donor or the seller, we can mark that. When an acknowledgement letter has been sent, um, when a payment process has been initiated. So it's also a really good place, again, to go in and at a glance, be able to tell where in the workflow this is to report back to a donor, to other stakeholders, um, to other colleagues in the library about what, what piece of the process that we're at with that. Um, so I would say that for us overall, it is something we're still working on implementing and changing some sort of different pieces. And I look forward now that the entire tool suite has been published and is out and available, diving in and incorporating more pieces of the tool suite and kind of building this out to be a little bit more robust. But so far it's been a really successful kind of set of experiments for us um, and has really improved our communication and our decision making and I think made for much better collection building um, and much more thoughtful stewardship as we have gone on over the course of the last couple of years. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen now, um, but I want to thank you so much and I know that Chela and I are both really excited about the Q&A and really welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Kerry, and I uh, might invite you and Chella to pop your uh, video on and join the audience for the Q&A. <clears throat> it's just so useful to hear the practical application of the tools and especially, you know, have 
<clears throat> excuse me, illustrations like the pain points being around storage and conservation activities and just to sort of give us a, a very live picture of how that works. I'm also really struck by the layers of advocacy that it enables, you know, library to donor, library to leadership, team to team. Um, <clears throat> we do have a few questions here for you, I think, based on that experience, Kerry, that you were talking through. Um, one was simply how long uh, does the process take or did the process take in your case end to end um, and I guess as a joint as a joiner to that um, does the web form allow multiple users to um, input at different times or is this all on one person it will allow different users to input at different times um, and it is definitely something that we see as a shared responsibility um, and it's really important to us that a lot of people see this as part of their jobs and, and are invested in the, the same process so that it's not just one person driving everything. Um, so filling out that particular web form, the main responsibility there does tend to be with a curator or someone who's doing collection development. Um, but all of that workflow pieces that I showed at the end, that's usually our acquisitions manager. So there are different people who are coming in at different points and certainly the potential, uh, or sorry, the operational impact report is a very collaborative process that is usually drafted mostly by someone in our, technical services, collection services group, but takes in inputs from, from lots of different folks across the libraries, including people who are not in our units um, or our particular division. And I would say in terms of how long it takes to go through that process, um, that really depends. So sometimes for a small collection or something that's pretty straightforward, or certainly for something that a curator has been working on for a long time and has a lot of familiarity with. It's a very fast process, actually. Um, sometimes it takes quite a while to get the information. I think that one thing that's useful about that is sometimes if this is taking too long, it means we're not quite ready to be at a decision making point and it needs, we need to learn a little bit more before we're ready to move forward. So I think that it's, it's an initial indicator that I don't want to quite say that something's wrong, um, but it's, it's an indicator that we probably need to take a step back if it's taking a really long time and do some more thinking. And of course, as we know through NASA, anything collaborative, you sort of add on, <laughs> add on a buffer of time there. The million dollar question, has it had an impact on, on backlog yet? At Rose. Um, it's, it has been a very helpful way for us to prioritize our backlog logs. Um, it's so hard to tell if it's had an impact on backlogs generally yet, um, because this last year has been an extremely unusual year in terms of we haven't had the same capacity to actually address our backlogs. We haven't been in the office and doing our processing and cataloging to the same level. Um, we also haven't been collecting at quite the same level I will say it certainly has um, led to both saying no to collections that we might have taken in prior to this and has led to um, a lot fewer surprises about collections that we have taken in, but we know as we decide to collect something, um, it is a much more kind of in informed consent kind of decision to, to bring things in. So. It's a little bit unclear, I think, partly because our data set is very strange. Um, that makes sense. And I guess um, Johnny here in Q&A is touching on something I was wondering too, uh, maybe one for you too, Chella, is that uh, a question about the kind of um, um, applicability of the tool to very small teams as well as very large teams, you know, and is it possible to use it uh, in a very small organization or just for one team? I think Kerry mentioned the digitization and preservation units, you know, is it possible to use this tool for one component uh, to make a case to, to the rest of your organization or a donor? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that the across the tool set there are the tools can be used in smaller organizations maybe not all of them um, but they're worth looking at uh, to see what might be relevant and helpful to you i think the cost estimation tools are are really um i would have loved when i was at a small institution with three archivists to be able to say like 
to my director who wanted us to take in something that was just like way beyond our capacity to say, okay, but that's going to be three years of our work. Right. Um, so, and you know, the collection development policy template, I think is broadly applicable. The processing plan template template is broadly applicable. Um, like I, I, Carrie and I both talked about, they're pretty maximal in nature. Like we put a lot of stuff in these forms. Please don't let that scare you. <laughs> um, uh, they, they, we really did try to think broadly about all of the things that might be relevant in different institutions, um, but won't be relevant in all of them. So we really did intend for them to to try to capture everything that might be useful, but but to be customized in individual institutions. Great. And do you know of case studies, or can you imagine case studies of, of libraries or special collections institutions using the findings from uh, this process to um, go back to donors who perhaps to perhaps manage expectations about what will happen with a collection once it's handed over, sort of how quickly that will be processed and made available to the public? I mean, does that seem like one of the one of the um, reasons for using the tool as well as organizational? information? Absolutely. Carrie, do you have? Yeah, I was going to say that is actually one of the ways that we have been using it and it has been helpful to us um, is we do have one of our curators in particular, I was having a meeting with him last week and he's like, okay, here's what I want to see done. Here's the other thing I want to see done. I have this donor over here who has pretty high expectations about what we're going to do. Let me make sure that I understand that if I do this, like if we do this, this, and this first, that means that it will be X many years before we do the thing that she wants. So I know when I go back to that conversation with her that I am kind of managing her expectations appropriately. So we have already seen that use kind of come through. That's fantastic. And I guess so much more satisfying than um, saying it will probably take us three years and having that response of why, if you can sort of show, um, we have a practical question too about software um, that is required, I guess, to, to use the form. Um, Barbara in WA is asking, once you fill in the initial form, do you further update the spreadsheet or is, is there any further requirement? Is it simply Excel? The tool that we use is actually Airtable, which is an online application, spreadsheet application, but it could be a Google form. It could just be an Excel, Excel spreadsheet. Um, so there's no technical requirements. Whatever tools you're already using should be adaptable to, to this kind of work. Um, we do go in and do updates, but we chose to just go with tools that we already use. So nothing special. That's and the, the, the tools themselves that are downloadable from the website are just Word documents and Excel files and PDFs. So nothing, uh, nothing too exotic Tricky, there. Super accessible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is wonderful. And I think comments beyond this are really just to thank you for your time and the tools, um, which I know will be useful to many. Our main question is, is the session recorded so people can share it with colleagues? And I'm sure you'll be getting lots of um, visits to that, that page. Um, today and, and onward. So I, I think we're just about on the minute. So I would like to thank you so much again, Chella and Kerry, for joining us um, much later in your day than ours and um, for generously sharing this work with us. We really appreciate it. Stay tuned, um, everybody, through the NASLA YouTube channel and the website, and we'll be sharing um, the recording of this session. Thanks so much.